All right. So by a show of hands, how many people are passionate about what they do? All right. Not bad. Good. OK. Well, what gets me out of bed in the morning is building and flying low-cost, highly capable spacecraft. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So um, one of the things is, as flight software engineers, this applies to us too, even if we're working on Class A missions, because uh, you may find yourself assigned to a, a spacecraft a project that's using streamlined development methods. You may find yourself working for one of these Silicon Valley new space companies, better, faster, cheaper, build small, capable spacecraft. Or, as I see it, as technology advances, you're going to find that a lot of the, the Class A spacecraft of tomorrow look like some of the small spacecraft of today. So let's talk about it. So everything we're going to talk about is in the context of small spacecraft development. A quick word about me so you understand where I'm coming from. Um, I spent eight years at JPL developing flight software for robotic planetary missions. Uh, flight software engineer for Mars Pathfinder, which actually next year is the 20th anniversary of our landing on Mars. Um, the Galileo Orbiter Rescue Mission, others at JPL, and then a group of us left to start a company in Silicon Valley that did IP satellite over satellite networks, and that was for me five companies ago. Uh, let's see, one that you might recognize is Skybox Imaging, which does low-cost Earth uh, observation spacecraft. Uh, when we started, it was just 12 of us in a golden retriever. And as head of flight software, I reported directly to the golden retriever. Um, and most recently, iFluence, which allows you to control your computing devices using just your eyes. And those are for uh, virtual reality and augmented reality headsets. Uh, Skybox Imaging ended up as part of Google, and last October, iFluence ended up as part of Google. But now I'm back to doing what I love, which is uh, software and programmatic consulting for commercial and academic flight teams building small spacecraft. So let's talk about what we're going to do. So normally, when I speak here, um, I like to pick one topic and go deep. But today, I've just grabbed a, a number of disparate uh, topics that come up with small spacecraft design that I want you to at least be aware of. The idea is to generate some thought and discussion. So we're going to talk about designing for quality, uh, LEO operations and flight software, because most of these small spacecraft are in uh, LEO right now, uh, spacecraft security, some things to think about, uh, spacecraft visibility, which goes to our last lecture, uh, and safe mode and autonomous recovery. So everything we're going to talk about today is in the context of small spacecraft design. And I want you to kind of tilt your thinking 90 degrees a little bit. The good news is the fundamentals are the same, whether you're doing a Class A or you're doing a small spacecraft. But you have to be very careful about getting stuck in your Class A mentality dogma. Um, and that can really trap you. If you try to take your Class A process and scale it down to a small schedule, uh, an aggressive schedule and a small budget, you're going to be screwed. And I've seen it time and time again. So let's take a look at how these, some of these new space companies do things. The first thing is um, cost as a driver. Um, these new space companies want to revolutionize space travel by lowering its cost. So cost is a fundamental driver. Um, as a result, they, they approach things differently from traditional spacecraft building organizations. And we'll get into this a little bit through the presentation. But there's more than I can really talk about uh, today. Uh, commercial off-the-shelf uh, components married with a streamlined development process. So um, what they're doing is they're developing the spacecraft fundamentally differently and operating them fundamentally differently than the traditional spacecraft building organizations. So you may recognize the subsystems. You can look at it and say, yeah, that's a spacecraft. But when you delve in deeply, your assumptions about reliability, radiation tolerance, cost, they're, they're skewed. And we'll just touch upon. There's so much to talk about, but we'll just talk about a few things today. So if you take one thing from this discussion, 
this is what I want you to take away, which is designing for quality. How many people have heard this saying, better, faster, cheaper, pick any two, ha, ha, ha. Every, okay. So I get this from two groups of people. I get the old hands at the traditional uh, spacecraft building institutions, and they quote it like they're quoting Plato, right? And um, to me, what it tells me is that they fundamentally either don't understand quality, there's a misconception there, or their organization is incapable of building high quality at a low cost on an aggressive schedule. But surprisingly enough, I also get it from the new space companies. They say, Steve, you don't understand. We're agile. We're agile. We're agile. We're going to build the first generation of spacecraft, and then the second generation, and the third generation. And if the first generation has problems, the second generation will be on orbit really quick, and it'll fix those problems. We're going to iterate. Well, the problem is this approach in practice has a lot of issues. The first is, in order to meet their aggressive launch schedule, very frequently your second generation is shipping to the launch site as the first generation is arriving on orbit. And you get things like, oh yeah, we have a small hardware problem, and sure, we can fix it. Oh, but we have to break configuration on the spacecraft we're about to ship. Um, then you get issues, all sorts of issues like that, where the chain is broken, and you know, the, the, they say, we're gonna fail fast. And the only part I take issue with is the fast part. Um, they end up taking more time debugging and troubleshooting poor quality spacecraft on orbit. Um, now, I, I should say there are some sm uh, companies that are doing it right, and I think we can learn a lot from them. Um, but let's talk about quality. So when anybody comes in and says, I'm going to improve quality, any manager, senior vice president, CEO, you know they're full of crap. Because everybody has a definition of quality, so let me quickly define what I mean when I say quality. I mean the spacecraft meets the mission requirements, it's relatively free of defects, it has the required capability, it's economical, and it's easy to fly, which will actually go toward economical. Okay? It, essentially, the system does its job well. Now, based on this definition, I'm here to tell you that I think the McDonald's hamburger is really high quality. Why? Because I can go anywhere in the world and get a McDonald's hamburger, and it's the same hamburger. And for what it's designed to do, which is deliver fat and salt and calories and satiate my hunger, it does it really, really well. Is it filet mignon? No. But that's not what it's, the, the job it's designed to meet. The Honda Civic. It's a very high quality car. Is it a Cadillac? No. But will anybody argue with me that the Civic is not a high quality car? Because for what it's designed to do, which is economical transportation that's reliable, it does an excellent job. So the trick is to design the right spacecraft for your mission and company. Now, how many people here manage software development by a show of hands? Okay. How many people manage other engineers? Show of hands. How many people manage yourself as if you're the manager? OK. Um, who can tell me what the iron triangle is? One of the managers here. What's the iron triangle? Software development managers. OK. So the iron triangle refers to, pro it's a project management um, concept, and it refers to three things, schedule, resources, and features. Now, the, the standard for project management is if you can control any two of those variables, you can compensate for, for missing the third. And very frequently, um, people don't understand the iron triangle, and what they do is they try to cut corners when what you should be doing is cutting features. And so when you look at the spacecraft that these um, small organizations are developing, very frequently, they don't have what I'll call the bells and whistles of a class A of an MSL, for example. But they do the job and they do it well. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that cheating is a valid engineering solution. And by cheating, what I mean is, and we did this a lot on Mars Pathfinder, 
you, if you have a problem that's difficult or appears intractable, you reframe the problem into something else you can solve, right? You can't have a big rocket to decelebrate before entering the Mars atmosphere. No problem, you go ballistic, you go in at 17,500 miles an hour, and you end up with airbags, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, let me just cover, check my notes, see if there's anything else. Um, so let's talk about um, LEO operations and flight software, because most of these spacecraft are in, in low Earth orbit. Now remember, let me give you an example of Skybox. So Skybox, we started with 12 kids fresh out of Stanford and a golden retriever. And um, three years later, we had two fully capable imaging spacecraft in orbit. We had built the company, everything, ground data systems, uh, our high bays, our ground support equipment, all from scratch for less than $90 million, and we did it in two and a half years. Um, so you can't assume when you're working on these streamlined projects that you have the resources of a JPL or a DSN. So most of them are in um, polar orbits, and you're talking about um, passes of about duration about two to 12 minutes, because don't forget you're poor. You don't have the DSN resources. What you can do is you can build one, maybe two ground stations, you're gonna put them near the pole, and you're probably gonna pick the North Pole because you get better data connectivity from the North Pole than the South Pole. And as a result, you've got spacecraft in a polar orbit about 90 minutes, and they're coming overhead, and depending on their elevation on the horizon, you're gonna get between two and 12 minutes every 90 minutes, okay? Um, so the other thing is the whole purpose of bringing down this, um, the cost of space travel is to get a lot of spacecraft in orbit. For example, if you have a imaging satellite that costs $6 million complete with launch, um, you can put a lot of them up there. Think about what that does to your revisit time. That's an example of the strategies that these new space companies are going to use. So as a flight software developer, you're gonna say, well, I get maybe two minutes every 90 minutes to talk to my spacecraft, and oh, by the way, I may have 70 of them in orbit over my two ground stations, okay? Um, so you need to design your spacecraft operations and, and gear it toward in the telemetry design, the command uh, vocabulary, because when you have a two-minute contact, you better be bandwidth e efficient with your telemetry, right? Um, what you end up doing, just the operational tempo is so quick, you get into this mode of spacecraft comes over the horizon, assess, receive your data, task the spacecraft for the next several orbits, oh, it's over the hill, okay? It's a very fast operational tempo. You don't have time to say, um, uh, uh, please uh, radiate sequence one, two, three, four, five to the spacecraft, it's gone. So you're building a system that's automated all the way through tasking the spacecraft using heuristics, through the radiation of the commands, and even the assessing of the health. So you don't have, um, you, you have automated commanding, you don't have um, a lot of human in the loop, but what you do have, these small organizations don't have the institutional knowledge of a JPL or, um, or the heritage, so you get a lot of cow people wanting to do cowboy ops, and, and don't let them do that, um, because that, there, there's some wonderful stories from that. Um, security, so it's embarrassing when teenagers hack into your spacecraft. Um, so when you're, when you're out at Mars, or Saturn, or Pluto, you're, you're on the DSN, right, 70 meter dishes, Whereas if you're doing a low Earth orbit, inexpensive spacecraft, a teenager from Denmark can try to hack your spacecraft, right? So you need to be aware of this. And when you design your spacecraft flight software, security has to be designed in from the start. Now that doesn't mean you turn it on immediately. In fact, I like designing the spacecraft doing the actual flight software implementation and being able to throw a switch and turn on security because you wanna debug everything before you turn on security because then if things break, you know it was security. 
Um, so what are some of the design parameters? Don't get locked out. It's embarrassing. Um, design the system so you can never be locked out of a healthy spacecraft. The security state should be deterministic. You should always know the security posture of your spacecraft. Communication problems. You need to separate your security problems from your communication problems. You need to have accountability, visibility all the way through the system, and this includes the ground data system. If a command doesn't get to the spacecraft, I want to know exactly where, and if even if the spacecraft is not commandable, I want telemetry coming from the spacecraft to tell me what the issue is. Um, and, and that goes even if you're encrypting the uplink. Um, safe mode and anomalies. Consider how entering safe mode changes the security posture of your spacecraft. Um, think about if you have a command loss response, how that's going to affect your security posture, and make sure you make the decisions explicitly and don't have them surprise you later. Um, bandwidth consumption, if you're designing security for your spacecraft and you're encrypting, maybe AES-256, <coughs> maybe something else, um, how does this affect the bandwidth of your link to the ground? How does this affect the data return on a noisy link? How does this affect your link budget? If you lose your size of your code blocks, how, what's going on there? And then lastly, the key material, okay? Um, how do you protect your key material in your mission operations center, in your ground support equipment? In your ground support equipment, if a subcontractor is fabricating the spacecraft. In your ground support equipment, if you're launching from Kazakhstan, um, you're, you're in a foreign country, you need to protect your key material. Okay? Um, so here are some guidelines you can do. Um, these, again, this is a flow of consciousness. Consciousness. The first is no security through obscurity. Security is binary. You're either secure or you're not. There's nothing in between. You can't say, oh, they don't know the command format for our spacecraft. They'll never guess it. No problem. Yes. So the, the standard you need when you design your security for your spacecraft is even if Every single detail of your system is publicly known, published on the internet, um, all over the world. Nobody can get into your spacecraft unless they have the key material, whether it's a security key or whether it's a certificate. Okay? Um, fuzz your software. Test, 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 right? Better, faster, cheaper is all about testing the heck out of the system and security is part of that, and fuzzing. You can learn a terrific amount by fuzzing. Who, who can define fuzzing for me? Okay, I, I thought I, so fuzzing is a uh, term used in security. What you generally do is send gibberish to your system. And so um, there are two ways you can fuzz your spacecraft. You can send complete nonsense up to it, but more often than that, it's gonna reject it. Um, what you generally, my favorite thing to do is have valid commands with valid opcodes, and then you put random garbage in the rest of the packets if you're using packetized, right? And you send it up, and you should be doing this in your nightly build and test. Who does nightly build and test to their flight software, please? Okay. Who does continuous integration? Ooh, okay. That's nice. All right. Fuzz your software there, please. Um, Anticipate anomalies. Consider how your security posture changes. We talked about that. Um, never allow commands or telemetry recorded during testing integration or in previous passes to be used against you. Replay attack. Protect against replay attack. There are very common, uh, there's a common toolbox of ways to prevent replay attack, and you should be using one of those out of your toolbox. Um, visibility. This goes to our previous lecture. Visibility is extremely important. Remember, you bought your spacecraft at Radio Shack, right? You went out there and you selected components off the shelf and you came up with a system of uh, qualifying those parts to fly on your low-cost spacecraft. But what if you're wrong? 
And until you launch it, you'll never know the answer. So visibility is extremely important, and it's extremely important in a small spacecraft environment because you've got your short passes, you've got your limited downlink, and this can, besides your short passes, you may be in weird attitudes, you may have power, health um, issues, time sharing with the payload. Some, some companies, they actually use the same antenna for payload and telemetry, they just don't do it simultaneously. Um, Off-track data. So be aware that if you've got these short passes, you know, you're, you're in an inclined orbit and you're coming over your ground station, you may have collected more data and more telemetry in your time off track than you can possibly downlink over this pass. So you need to have a strategy when you design your spacecraft to manage data on board so you can determine how to return the data you need over one or more passes. Um, and, and there are a variety of ways to do it, prioritization, um, very data decimation, um, different ways to do it. Um, changing rates. Um, uh, there's a tendency to design for the nominal telemetry rates instead of the telemetry rates you get when you're in safe mode and tumbling. So be aware of that. Um, and then the last one is many spacecraft, arbitrating between multiple spacecraft over your ground st station simultaneously. And the other one that many of these new companies, you say, oh, we're going to launch 20 spacecraft off the first vehicle and then 30 spacecraft off the second launch vehicle. Well, what if there's a common mode failure? Okay. You're going to have all of these spacecraft demanding attention and you better have a strategy for dealing with many six spacecraft simultaneously. So one way to approach this problem of visibility is to categorize your data. Okay. So you've got real-time data, which is the current state of the spacecraft. It's timely data. It's instantaneous feedback on the performance. And it's what you're going to get when you come on track. Because for the other 90 minutes, you're on the other side of the planet and you've got no connectivity. Um, for that, you've got recorded data. You've got off-track data used to reconstruct spacecraft behavior. So this is over the course of the or orbit. Um, this catches anomalies, what I'll call slow anomalies that occur on the spacecraft while it's off track. The other thing you do with this data is you do trending. And as flight software engineers, we sometimes forget, because we don't do as much operations as maybe we should, of the need to do trending on spacecraft. Um, if you're the thermal guy, if you're the power guy, if you're the ACS controls analyst looking at the performance of the vehicle, you're going to want long-term trending data. And too often, we neglect that as flight software engineers. Um, high rate data. So this goes to the, the previous from, um, one. When I design low cost spacecraft, I always have what I, uh, what I call a first fault capture data capture system. It's like a black box for the spacecraft. You get data at a very high rate, much too high for telemetry. You can set traps. You can describe a problem to the spacecraft. So when it happens again, it gets it and it's Got a, uh, it's frozen all the telemetry and non-volatile memory, lots of things. And with a small spacecraft, you really need this because, again, you're qualifying all your parts and your system simultaneously for the very first time. And a lot of things, especially SEUs, things like that, they happen at a very high rate. And if you don't have a method of recording high rate data and a smart way of recording high rate data, You'll, you'll lose it and you'll be back to square one. So going on to safe mode and autonomous recovery. So let's talk about safe mode. Do we agree what safe mode is? Safe mode is a power safe, thermally safe, communication safe state that protects the payload. So one of the things with these small spacecraft, much of your orbit is spent in eclipse. Right? You're constantly balancing power between eclipse and when you're in the sunlight. And one of the things you need to do in the flight software, too, is look out for coming over the terminator out of eclipse. Because if you're in a low power state, what will happen is the spacecraft may hibernate. It may even shut off in eclipse. You come over the terminator. You get some sunlight on the solar panels. Up comes the flight computer. Flight computer says, all right, we just rebooted. I'm going to turn everything on and start pointing the spacecraft. 
and lo and behold, you bounce like a yo-yo. So you got to take these things into consideration. Um, thermally safe, do you need to actively control your spacecraft's temperature? I dislike active control of temperature. I actually like to design spacecraft that passively are really cool. There's no software about it. Makes my job very easy. Um, communication state, can you talk to the spacecraft at any attitude? Uh, payload, uh, what are the requirements for your payload? Can you design a payload which is uh, safe in any attitude, for example, at any power state? And if you can do these things, you can do a lot of cool, neat stuff. For example, you've got this spacecraft you bought at Radio Shack, and you don't know what works and what doesn't. Wouldn't it be cool if you can just turn everything off in safe mode? You know, just you got your radio, and you can try your different radios, but you can turn attitude control right off. Matter of fact, it might be thermally better to tumble the spacecraft. You can design the spacecraft so it's actually thermally safer tumbling than trying to be three-axis stabilized. You can use your imagination and really design a simple, robust, slick system. So be aware of this. Give yourself a really rock-solid safe mode because you may spend some time there because it's a brand new system. Um, special considerations. With commercial off-the-shelf hardware, um, SEUs should be considered a normal part of doing business. Let me explain. Your spacecraft is an earning asset, whether you're doing imaging, whether you're collecting uh, weather data, whether you're doing comms and relaying messages, okay? It's got to be up 5.9 system. 99.99% of the time, you want it flying. Well, if you're flying through the South Atlantic anomaly with commercial off-the-shelf components, you're going to take SEUs. Now, hopefully, you've figured out a way to qualify your commercial off-the-shelf stuff so you know what its radiation tolerance is going to be, but you design for the worst case. And in that worst case, you know what? You may have to fail operationally. You may not want to go into safe mode if the spacecraft suddenly reboots because you've got a job to do. And you can't sit there and take up to 90 minutes to recover the spacecraft. And if it takes several orbits to recover the spacecraft, you're screwed almost for the year, I think. I have to do the math again. Um, so consider failing operationally. Your spacecraft is an earning asset. Your spacecraft spends most of its time off track. And this goes toward autonomy. And if you have a cheap fleet, each spacecraft still needs to look after itself because of that dreaded common mode failure. Okay. So um, that's all I have for now. Questions, comments, criminal accusations? Okay. Yes. Oh. So you mentioned a, a smart way to record uh, high rate data on a failure? Yes. What, can you talk more about that? So I do this in all my terrestrial systems. I do it. I have created, and actually I've written this up in a magazine called Embedded Systems Programming Magazine. And you can go look for it. The article, I think, is called The Software Detective. Okay. And what you do is I call this first fault data ca capture. And it allows you to dynamically create buffers and take everything that's going into your telemetry at the rate it's reported, and you can choose what you want to see. You can see, have many buffers of different measurements. You can put measure, uh, different, a set of measurements in one buffer. You can dynamically size them. And basically, you can set what I call a freeze. And when a problem occurs of a specific signature, which you can describe by referencing your telemetry system, it will freeze that data in non-volatile memory. And um, in some of the smaller spacecraft, I've used a lot of um, non-volatile storage devices that people who build Class A probably wouldn't touch, but they work. Um, and you should consider flying some of this really cool non-volatile memory. Um, I, does that help? Does that give you a general idea of how to do it? So the month and year for the embedded uh, technology? Uh, just, just type in uh, the software detective. Software. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah, and hopefully they, it's still there because the magazine isn't in print anymore. Of that magazine? Yeah. Really? Yeah, go, go get it. That's cool. No, I. I yeah. <laughs> I'll leave with them in my coat. They gave us permission. That's that's very cool. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.